Today's lecture is the last of part two of the course, the myth of national self-determination, the story of the Faustian myth, too, of development and the promise of integration with democracy that we have been tracing ever since 1848, if not 1700. And the main argument of today's lecture, which runs counter, perhaps, to the way in which you have previously encountered Hitler and Stalin, is to suggest how Hitler's New Europe and Stalin's New Russia represent not a repudiation or a rejection of the dream of modernity, but its defamiliarized culmination. How Hitler and Stalin, as the most radical and probably the most awful figures of the 20th century, in their cruelty and in their uh, uh, disregard for human life, don't so much turn their back on the promises of modernity as carry them in a defamiliarized and perhaps perverted way to fulfillment. So how do Hitler and Stalin, how do the Nazi regime and the, and the Bolshevik Russia under Stalin represent this culmination rather than a rejection? Often we think of them as, as, as reactionary figures or as totalitarian, authoritarian figures, and we want to separate out what we like about modernity. We like to say that modernity, if only it had followed the right path, would have taken us to a, a place of democracy, of development, of recognition of human rights. And moving forward from this lecture, in the next few weeks, we'll be looking at how re both Europe and the Soviet Union tried to come to terms with what had happened under Hitler and Stalin and to move forward into a future that would take the promise of modernity onward. But today's lecture, then, is about this culminating moment, the moment when Hitler and Stalin become, you could say, the dominant figures in Europe and Russia, respectively. There's a symmetrical form to today's lecture. And I want to begin by taking us back to what modernity is in some level all about, or one thing that perhaps hasn't been focused on enough, and that is making a wor the world better for common people. Making the world for better for common people. And who are common people? Above all, they're workers of one form or another. Syndicalism is the word for the uh, trade union movement, for the workers' movements uh, that were really prominent in southern Europe, in France, but also in Italy, in Spain. Uh, and they often took a rather kind of militant attitude about labor. The labor had to organize, labor had to unionize, and through organizing and unionizing, labor and workers could claim their rightful place in the world, could become the chosen people of modernity in some sense. What I want to suggest to you with this lecture is that in many ways Hitler and Stalin represent the culmination if a perverted one, of modernity, because they are, their promise is first and foremost to the workers of the world and to the workers of their own country. The idea of a militant labor union lies at the root of Nazism, and it lies at the root of communism and Bolshevism as well. I began with this Polish tango, 1935, a song, a nostalgic song looking at the past, it became very popular precisely at the moment when the Soviet re Union reached the peak of its power and its reputation, and when perhaps the storm clouds were starting to appear on the horizon. 
the sense that perhaps what was best about humanity might be lost in the process of trying to remake the world uh, in, in the new, in the form, or in the, according to Stalin's dictates, uh, in order to make the world uh, according to, remake the world according to Stalin's vision of the new man. So we'll be looking at national socialism and the road to Hitler's Holocaust and then socialist nationalism and the road to Stalin's terror. The relationship between the principle of a common good, a socialist good, is common to them both, as is the very different emphasis on the importance of nations. And we'll end today's lecture thinking about, looking at the moment, the one brief moment, it doesn't last very long, when Hitler and Stalin formed their pact in 1939, the non-aggression pact, and basically decide that they divide up Europe and, and the Soviet Union or the uh, provinces of Russia, former provinces of Russia among themselves. Perhaps, and the question I'll leave you with then is, is, is this the culminating moment of this great story of the Faustian promise of modernity, the Hitler-Stalin pact, and the agreement on the part of these two uh, dictators and leaders who are in many ways, you could say, products of modernity rather than rejectors of it. They're often represented in similar ways. Uh, patriarchal figures, fathers to their people, Hitler with children, Stalin with children, common in the iconography. But I want to begin with these two images because they are perhaps in tension with the main thrust of today's argument, which is not about their, their forms as traditional patriarchal authority figures, but rather as participants in the story of changing the world beyond recognition, creating a new man, whether a Nazi superman or a Soviet superman, creating a new society, a new society that is supposed to redeem the problems, the failures, to deal with the enemies of the people, to find a chosen people who will make humanity ultimately better. Now, to get us in there, I, I, I want to begin, uh, well, move on right now to uh, a quotation from, that comes from the end of an important and famous essay by Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin was a German Jewish intellectual, perhaps the quintessential modernist, you could say intellectual, somebody who knew a little bit about everything, uh, wrote about art, wrote about work, and his uh, essay on the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, uh, published in 1936, uh, shortly before he was, well, as he was kind of escaping across Europe, he ran across uh, France to Spain, running away from the Nazis. Uh, and eventually perished, uh, I believe, close to around the Spanish, um, in Spain or on the Spanish border. But along the way, he spent a lot of time thinking about what modernity was and where modernity had taken human civilization. He talked about the modern process as one that had made the common modern man uh, a worker. The growing proletarianization of the modern man and the increasing formation of the masses, creating mass uh, publics and, and making uh, making uh, factory workers, sort of the, 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 the quintessential modern human being, are two aspects of the same process, he wrote. He went on to write that in this modern, uh, I could say, uh, cauldron, self-alienation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. This is a situation of politics which fascism is rendering aesthetic, Communism responds by politi politicizing art. He was a complicated writer. Many of the things he says and, and claims are not, you have to read twice or three times before you actually get exactly what he's saying. The, the, uh, the, the dominant thrust of this article, which is all about trying to understand what will happen to works of art in an age when industrial production and, in, and factory work has become all the more prominent uh, is to claim that art will lose its value. Art will cease to be what it, what it, what it had, uh, used to be in an era where individual works of art are, are, are esteemed and valued as, as, as uh, creations of primary significance. And part of the problem, he says, is that as, as we've been changed by the forces of, 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 of uh, development and, and, and factory production. Human beings have become increasingly self-alienated. They're increasingly cut off from the wellsprings of their own identities, their own purpose, their own meaning. And that it's this predicament that the two great 
radical ideologies of the present moment have seized control of. Communism and fascism are perfect for dealing with self-alienated people, people who are losing their sense of who they are. As a card-carrying communist, though, he talks about it in a way that, is, that shows how fascism is doing the wrong thing, but communism is doing the right thing. Fascism is, is, is uh, aestheticizing politics. It's making us treat all forms of political engagement as artistic display, as propagandistic display. You can think about the great rallies that Hitler engaged in, or Mussolini, and the flags, troops marching. All of this is the aestheticization of politics. Communism, he says, responds by politicizing art. That communism takes art and gives it deeper political meaning. Whether or not this opposition works, it's an important example of the way in which intellectuals of the 1930s are writing about, thinking about the self-alienation of human beings in the present moment and wondering about how communism and fascism have each in their own way dealt with it. To situate all of this in uh, this larger context of the story we've been telling, and the, the story especially of syndicalism, that is the worker uh, or the, the uh, organized labor, and, and the idea of a militant labor union, I want to show you in, with this slide and with this first section how the radical right and the radical left actually have some common origins. When we talk about left wing and right wing uh, uh, politics, we shouldn't forget that they were difficult to distinguish at the very beginning of the 20th century. Mussolini was a socialist before he became a fascist. He actually moved from socialism to fascism uh, over the course of World War I. And a lot of people who were socialists at one moment turned into fascists at another and, and went back and forth. It's harder, perhaps, from a present moment to imagine that, uh, that, that movement, but it was quite common in the day. The larger question here or the, at stake is what is the relationship between modernity and revolution? And what are the problems that humanity is facing? Have we undergone too much change or not enough? That's maybe the simplest way of putting it. Too much change or not enough? Does our world suffer because we've tried to make people different or because we haven't tried to make them different enough? Let you mull over that idea for a second. If there's something profoundly revolutionary about modernity, change, what kind of change should we bring about? And have we tried to change people too much? Or haven't we tried to change them enough? Now, the great modernist thinkers we've encountered so far, and the four most famous ones, we've mentioned all of these, Nietzsche less, least of all, but Darwin, Marx, Freud, all recognize that there is a profound violence at the root of our civilization. There's nothing more basic to the making of the modern world than struggle. They all used, all their theories are about struggle. Darwin, species struggle. Marx, class struggle. Freud, the struggle of the individual against his own id and against the dictates of the superego. Nietzsche, of course, is all struggle. But struggle was, you could say, the great word of and maybe some of, of, of modernity in the 19th century. No th social theory was formulated without the concept of struggle. And what is Hitler's biography? My struggle, right? Hitler. And so Hitler, in some ways, is the culmination of Darwin, Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, all of these thinkers talking about struggle as basic to the human condition and perhaps to modernity itself. Now, there's one figure who's less famous, but I belong entirely in this tradition, and he's the figure through which I, I think we can find the common roots of the radical right and the radical left, the common roots of fascism and communism. And that is the retired French engineer from the south of France, Georges Sorel. Very important intellectual and a very interesting one because he's something of a self-taught intellectual. He didn't, uh, he didn't get his philosophy from his university classes. He got it from his own reading. And he put together ideas in a new way. Basically, he, after going into retirement at the age of, I don't know, in the late 40s or early 50s, people retired earlier back in the day, he started writing. And he, and he became an enormously influential philosopher. And I've just put the two main ideas he is identified with and which takes us to the common roots of the rights and the left and the common roots of fascism and communism. His work on myth and will. Sorel, like Freud, Marx, and Nietzsche, emphasized the importance of will, your willpower. 
and myth in the making of, 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 of human civilization. What you believe might be more important than what is really out there, suggests Sorel. Your capacity to change the world is equal to your capacity to create a myth that people believe in and then to follow through on it with your will. And in order to change the world, to make it better, or to make it different, just violence is an, is a, an essential part of it. More clearly, perhaps, than Darwin, Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, George Sorwell speaks in praise and writes in praise of violence. Violence is the way we change the world. Our myths and wills can change the world. And immediately after the revolution of 1905, the failed revolution in Russia, of course, George Sorwell, uh, George, George Sorrell writes about how violence is what is missing from our attempts to change the world. He's asking the question of 1848, really the question of how Napoleon III came to power. This is his own language. How did mediocre and silly people become so powerful? Why do we live in a world where those who dominate society seem so dumb and seem to be in so, so ill-suited to rule and so far removed from the interests of the people? And he wrote in 1918 an essay in defense of Lenin. So you can see his, sort of his, his, his sympathies with communism at this moment. <laughs> he defends Lenin and Lenin's use of violence as necessary for creating a world that is better for the common people, for the workers. Myth, will, reflections of violence in defense of Lenin. So Sorelianism starts to spread in the early part of the 20th century in France and across Europe. What is Sorelianism? It has all of these elements in it. It's anti-liberal, it's anti-materialist, it's anti-positivist, it's anti-rationalist, it's anti-parliamentarian. It's against all those things that liberal democratic societies uh, following following the First World War, believe in and, and, and subscribe to. And, but it's unclear whether it's a left-wing movement or a right-wing movement, whether it's, it tends toward fascism or toward communism. In some sense, it tends towards both. So Sorel, in 1918, writes in defense of Lenin. But in 1909, he makes an alliance with this man here. Now, if you're French, you might recognize who he is. I don't know if anybody else. Here's uh, Charles Morat. Maras, the, uh, so the leader of the Action Francaise movement. And what is Action Francaise? It was a, an anti-Semitic, French nationalist, Catholic monarchist sort of movement uh, that uh, really attacked all forms of liberalism, materialism, positivism, rationalism, and parliamentarism. So Georges Sorel, as a figure, has praised Lenin, and he's also praised Charles Maurat. This is where we see sort of the common roots of the radical right and the radical left. The way they get expressed institutionally, and we'll, we'll, we'll end the intellectual history in just a bit, is in syndicalism and the concept of syndicalism, the workers' movement. Syndicalism is trade unionism, belief that we could create a better world if we took our industries and organized them into syndicates. Those are labor unions managed by workers. If the workers could rule themselves, we could create this world where we don't have to conform to elites. Well, we don't have to do what the billionaires and the millionaires tell us what to do. All of this is part of Sorel's sort of vision. Way to overcome the economic elites and run society fairly in the interest of informed and skilled majorities through union democracy. Democracy is, the, he's not anti-democratic, he's anti-liberal. Right? Democracy is still a very big part of what syndicalism and what Sorelianism is, is about. He asked the simple question, how can we achieve this world? A truly meaningful doc, demo, democracy, not liberal democracy, which only, only benefits the millionaires, but true democracy, which is actually in the interests of the working class. He has a very simple uh, sort of solution and diagnosis, and it's worth knowing because it keeps on echoing through the ideologies and the political programs of the 20th century. A general strike. If everybody just went on strike, we could actually change the world. How do we get a general strike? That becomes the problem, say, of Sorelian sort of thought and of syndicalism, trying to organize workers' unions in which people actually recognize their own interests and then figure out how to rise up and to rise up at the same time. In order to do this, he they, the, the workers have to be militant and organized. They have to conform to some kind of discipline in order to carry this out. 
If you're not militant and organized, nothing will change. The old elites will continue to dominate society, and, it will, and, the, and the society will just evolve. Uh, it will keep on, keep on moving as it always has. It won't change at all. Now, syndicalism gets expressed on the right and on the left. And it actually culminates in some ways in the Spanish Civil War, which we talked about last time. Revolutionary syndicalism, the anarcho-syndicalist union, the FAI and the CNT, these were parties and organizations fighting for the republic on the left in the Spanish Civil War. Franco, with his uh, sort of ideology of phalangism, was belonged to the national syndicalist sort of movement. In many ways, both the right and the left in the Spanish Civil War traced their roots to syndicalism and to George Sorel and to the promise of a general strike and to the notion of a militant and organized workers' movement. Both, you can say, subscribe to or believe in the principle, the, the ideal of solidarity. The only way we can do this is by getting everybody on the same page. And both are afraid, in their own ways, of the bourgeois and a bourgeoisie, the middle class. On the left, right, beware of making socialism bourgeois. It's sort of the, is the, is the, the underlying current or idea of the revolutionary syndicalist movement. Don't become middle class. Middle class means you become committed to your creature comforts, to the, your possessions. Believe in something. Believe in the idea of the movement. But that's exactly what the right is also saying. Beware of making nationalism bourgeois. Nationalism should be about believing in your people, believing in the folk. And you can see how both, in some sense, fascism and communism owe a debt to syndicalism that goes back to George Sorel. And both emerge, Nazism and, and Bolshevism, as solutions to a problem, to a world governed or ruled by the bourgeoisie, to a world ruled by money, and capitalism and the individual interests of uh, the, the rich, which are only expressed and protected through parliaments and through, uh, and through materialist ideologies. Even the colors of the right wing and the left wing in the Spanish Civil War were the same, red and black. And I'm wearing red today in <laughs> commemoration of this. <laughs> so what Ultimately, do uh, so the, the Nazi and the Soviets offer the world uh, that is similar. The great socialist economist Karl Polanyi, author of The Great Transformation, observes one point of commonality and similarity that he says fascism, if we want to understand it in economic terms, like socialism, was rooted in a market economy that refused to function. If this way, of Sorelian way of looking at the world, becomes especially powerful in the 1930s, why is that? What is about the 1930s that is special, that's different? Why doesn't it come to power in the 1920s? Great Depression. Great Depression. Economic crisis afflicting the entire world. And what happens in an economic crisis? In an economic crisis, it really undermines the position and the status of the bourgeoisie, the people who are in, 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 in the positions of greatest power. It shows the weakness of capitalism. And that's what both fascism and communism feed off of is that weakness in capitalism. If you look at what the, social, what the Soviet Union meant to the world in the 1930s, this is, remember, just before, in 1934, before the Great Terror, before the, you could say the horror of Stalinism was known, it meant, or it symbolized, going from 1927 to 1939, an, an ideology that had successfully resolved the problems of economics and of labor. The urban labor force in the USSR from 1927 grew, well, it grew uh, basically three times or, or four times even uh, from 1927 to 1939. When Stalin said in 1934, one of your assigned readings for this week is the 1934 interview with Stalin. You might notice when you're reading this, H.G. Wells interviewing Stalin, how obsequious H.G. Wells is, how he's asking questions to Stalin as the guy who's figured it out, who has created an economy that actually works, unlike the United States at the moment. In 1934, this was a moment where it seemed like the Soviet Union might have the answers. When Stalin says in 1934, it cannot be regarded as an accident that the country in which Marxism has triumphed is now the only in the country in the world which knows no crises and no unemployment, whereas in, 
in the other countries, including the fascist countries, crisis and unemployment have been reigning for four years now. When Stalin says this in 1934, it's not entirely wrong. It's actually something that a lot of other countries are noticing as well, including the United States, including Western European countries, and it's one reason why they're scared. Now, Stalin in this statement says in 1934, this is one year, remember, after Hitler comes to power, Hitler comes to power in 1933, in that the fascist countries have not solved unemployment. But that's precisely what Nazi Germany does. Unemployment from 1933 to 1939 goes from basically 5.6 million to zero. This is in the era of the Great Depression. This is in the era of unprecedented unemployment in England, in France, in the United States, above all. What I'm just trying to do with these slides is show you how the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany represent something that people in the 1930s want to believe in. They want to believe in a system where everybody can be employed, an economy that functions. The notion that um, we know the story about, and we often tell the story of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union as the story of sort of pathological states that went, went in the wrong way. And that's a fine way to tell a story, but I don't think it's a very useful way to tell a story because it doesn't allow us to understand the debt of Hitler and Stalin to the promise of modernity and to the way in which Hitler and Stalin resonated in the 1930s as fulfillments of the promise of modernity in a way that we no longer see them today. We can no longer remember them because we know all the horrible things they've done. Remember, this is a point at which 1934, Hitler's just come to power. We don't know what he's going to do. Stalin, too, he is still something of an unknown element. Yes, he's been, he's been engaged in some pretty bad repressions, and uh, the five-year plan was all horrible to the kulaks, Holodomor, but people don't know very much about that yet. The great terror, though, is yet to come. In the mid-1930s, as far away as Berkeley, California, where I used to teach this course, I just wanted to point out how Stalin and Hitler are actually seen as potential heroes in the Bay Area. You see Berkeley Yearbook 1935 is very much in the spirit of the 1930s. You notice the gear, the me development and, and the me mechanical sort of uh, symbol on the cover of the yearbook. The soldier, why would you put a soldier on the cover of a university yearbook? Well, this is a, in the era of militant labor and of militant transformations. And in the introduction to the yearbook, the students, basically a little your age or a little bit younger, are writing about what Berkeley hopes for the world. As students of a great university, we are vitally interested in the great struggle to save man and his civilization, they write. International House, the, the house symbol of worldwide amity and unity, serves as the frontispiece for our book, for in, in this ideal lies our hope for a unified world. Yes, the students of Berkeley are promising and hoping for a unified world. And for each of their sections, they use a different country of the world. For the section titled Organizations, they use Communist Russia under Stalin. Russia organizatia. Russia signifies dynamic life and experiment, hence the main movement of the workers and the soldiers. Workers and soldiers, emphasized in 1935, is shown on a diagonal plane. A touch of old Russia with its churches and ancient architecture is shown on the upper right, while the decoration on the lower left depicts her industry and aviation. Russia becomes, for the Berkeley Yearbook of California in 1935, a symbol of the right way to organize things. Even more surprising, and I, I, unfortunately I couldn't get the picture uh, for this, but I got the picture for the next one. This is the UC, uh, Berkeley yearbook of 1935 for athletics. They use Nazi Germany, and they have little swastikas in every page. And this is what they write. The blazing defiant swastika stands out in bold relief. Germany's progressive commercial spirit is shown by its aircraft carrier on the upper left and its ocean liner on the lower right. The left-hand group on the yellow background shows Germany's rebirth since its war and its glory to come in the 1936 Olympic Games. The workers, again, emphasizing workers, united under the Nazi government are shown on the right in the characteristic posture, raising their hands in the Nazi salute. My little point here is to maybe defamiliarize the 1930s for you, to show you how Hitler and Stalin are not yet the pathological creatures we know them to be later on. They're celebrated as far away as Berkeley, California, as figures who have promised to create a unified world, to overcome the divisions and find a solution to the economic problems facing the future. So on that note, so I want to move into 
the two separate stories. The story of the German Sonderweg and the rise of, Hit of Hitler to power, and then the parallel story about Stalin's sort of uh, rise, to, rise to prominence. The story of National Socialism, the road to Hitler's Holocaust, is really a story of how a failed artist became the Führer, the great leader of the, of, of the Nazi experiment. In his, you might remember uh, from our, my er earlier lectures that Hitler was an aspiring artist. These are some of his drawings, some of his paintings. He was hoping to gain admission to the Vienna School of, or uh, the Vienna, Vienna Academy of Art and was rejected twice, ends up living in that homeless shelter we, we, uh, in the early 20th century. Hitler is a failed artist. Self-portrait from an earlier, early time. So the first point I want to make, I want to make four points, and you might note these all down, because they are, I want you to sort of notice the similarities in the stories of Hitler and Stalin. My first big argument and point to you is that the Nazi party creates Hitler, Hitler doesn't create the Nazi party. That Hitler occurs in a larger context. The NSDAP, the National Socialist Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, exists. Uh, is created, and then Hitler joins it. The context in which Hitler happens is one that has to be sought in the cultural and social and political undercurrents of his time. It's too easy to see Hitler and Stalin as two pathological individuals who created all the bad things around them. But in many ways, they were created by their times, and that is the big point here. Hitler was created by his time. He did not create his times. And he was created by his times in a, in, in a, as a uniquely or interestingly modern figure. He was born in 1889 to parents Alois Hitler, a customs official, and to Clara Pölzel, a woman of peasant origins. In other words, Hitler comes from a very minor, uh, uh, and you could say, an undistinguished background. If the promise of modernity is to take small people and make them great, or to give them the possibility to fulfill their dreams, to take people who have no breeding or background, Hitler in some ways fulfills that story. He comes from people from the lower, lowest stratum of society, and he rises to the top and ends up dominating the world, a little bit like Napoleon did before him, or Stalin does in another part of the world. So Hitler's first and the first part of his story, like most modernist stories, is a story of failure. Applications to the Vienna Art School, of course, the the, 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 uh, the art establishment doesn't want him. He gets rejected, this homeless shelter. And finally, he finds his way, he makes his way in World War I, where he's sort of decorated for bravery. And he gets his first sense of, you could say, self-respect. In 1920, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, that is what the Nazi Party is, the Workers' Party. And we often, I think, we get caught up in, 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 in other aspects of it. And we fail to sort of notice the, the rhetorical importance of the idea of the worker to what the Nazis were attempting to achieve comes into being. And Hitler joins it very kind of early on. Uh, by, 19, by the end of the next year, he is a member, and he quickly rises to the ranks. He finds that with his newfound, you could say, confidence from his, uh, from his World War I exploits, he is, uh, and his anger, his anti-Semitism already cultivated in Vienna against the Jews for having stolen, you could say, all the great positions in society from, from the Aryans. And from his, uh, you could say, his argument about World War I, too, the stab in the back. And the, he decides he's going to try to make a stab at political power. In 1923, uh, now at the head, you could say, of the Nazi party, he helps to lead, with the help of uh, the World War I war hero, uh, General Erich Ludendorff, the Beer Hall Putsch, an attempt to take over the government in Munich. Some images from there. Uh, and this ultimately fails. He's put in prison. And like many revolutionaries, he ends up cultivating his, his sensibilities in prison. Stalin spends a lot of time in prison, too. He writes Mein Kampf uh, with, the, with the help of Rudolf Hess, who, uh, and, uh, and starts to articulate the ideology and the vision with which he comes to dominate Germany in the next uh, decade. In 1932, the last free parliamentary elections uh, in Germany take place. 
And we see, even in this day and age, the Nazi party does not get a majority in the sense of no, no party gets more than, than 50%. But, they, but in the last three elections, they do get the most, uh, have the most significant showing, uh, followed by the Social Democratic Party. It's interesting that the socialists are right behind sort of the Nazis. Those are the, the two top sort of performers here before the communists next. And, that, and presumably, if the communists and the socialists were not separate, they perhaps might have done better. And he gets appointed uh, chancellor uh, to an ailing, uh, uh, because people think he can be easily controlled, that he's not a serious political figure, and he's very popular at the same time. The larger point of the slide, though, is Hitler's rise to power happens within a social, political, cultural context, and it happens within the context of a party that is devoted to promoting the interests and saving the, uh, saving the worker. The second point here is about uh, all these points are, uh, to some extent, about how Hitler and Stalin, right now we're doing Hitler, though, resonate with their time, how they correspond to the promises of modernity and offer answers that people are excited about. And, or, or at least endorse. So Hitler, the first point is that Hitler is, uh, is a member of a party and part of a movement that is about supporting the common people and the workers. The second point here is that as uh, he revised national, national pride, as cultivating a form of Germany as the leading nation of the Aryan master race. The idea of Volksgemeinschaft, of, of uh, sort of community, economics, so the people's community, is at the root of what, what uh, the Nazi project is all about. If the swastika is an old Zoroastrian sun symbol, you notice it here surrounded by a modern mechanical gear. The phrase reactionary modernism has been used to describe what the Nazism was. And it's important not to forget the thrust toward the future in Nazism at the same time as we acknowledge the glance or the look back to the past. The Reich Ministry of Food and Agriculture and the, you could say, the, the ideology of, of, of people's community, of, of celebrating blood and soil, makes the German peasants and the workers the chosen people, you could say, of, of the German nation who are supposed to carry this, uh, uh, the, the world into the future. The Volkswagen is one of sort of, you could say, a Nazi invention, right? It's 1938. Well, what does it mean? The Volkswagen is the people's car. The people's car. It's about a car that's supposed to be more accessible to common, ordinary people than BMWs or, um, or Mercedes. The notion that car should be accessible to everyone who is a member of the nation. And, of the, and the form hasn't changed all that much over the years. Here's... Uh, Hitler and his sort of officials uh, exulting over the, over the development of the form of the Volkswagen. Along the way, Germany also develops. So Nazi Germany developed something that we, we shouldn't forget. It's the DAF, the German Labor Front, the National Socialist Trade Union Organization, if you think back to socialism, uh, syndicalism. An organization devoted to promoting the interests of workers, building the Autobahn for more, more convenient transportation, the Volkswagen, the people's car, but also through the slogan, Kraft durch, durch Freude, strength through joy, becomes the leading tourist industry in the world. In Nazi Germany, more people are sent on a vacation than ever before among the working class. If we want to find out why did Germans support Hitler and the Nazis, it was because he gave them more than anybody else had given them in the past. Leading tourist industry in the world, and the notion that paid vacation or and and, and uh, an eight-hour workday should be a part of what uh, of the way in which we organize our society. But modernity can involve a system that doesn't demand back-breaking labor uh, that exploits the worker, but actually commemorates and and supports the worker. Was part of the enthusiasm for 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 the Nazi regime. And that there were, was a, uh, a National Socialist Trade Union organization became an important, you could say, uh, note for other countries, too, noting how the Nazis had gained support of their own society through creating trade union organizations. And other societies also started to do that as well. 
Now, one thing that's important to note in, uh, in this story is that there were never more than 7% of Germans in the Nazi party. Very similar percentage we'll see in the Soviet Union, too. In fact, in most, uh, most uh, radical sort of party organizations of, of, uh, of interwar Europe, membership over 10% was unheard of. Because the party did not represent everybody in society. It represented the avant-garde, the fighting, cutting edge. The vision that membership in, this society, in, in the party was a sign of your superiority within that society. Everybody should aspire to become. Fewer, all are called, but few are chosen. This is, you could say, kind of the, the ethic of the Hitler Youth League and ultimately of the Communist Party as well in the Soviet Union. In, um, we notice the Sorelian word will, or the idea of the triumph of the will. Uh, the notion that you can become whatever you believe makes its way into uh, the ideology of Nazism. Lenny Riefenstahl's most famous, uh, uh, most famous propaganda film, Triumph of the Will, uh, documented the 1935 Nuremberg rally, where Hitler speaks to the German youth and talks about the me uh, what they are supposed to represent, what they are supposed to do, and I want to play for you this brief clip from the Nuremberg rally and from Riefenstahl's film, because perhaps it will give you a sense, too, of what, why this message resonates, even as we are chilled by it today. Adolf Hitler, the of the German Jugend, has the word. Interesting, peace-loving is part of the rhetoric as well. So the, the, the message 
to be one, not to be divided, to learn obedience and sacrifice, to overcome the egoism of self-interest and to serve a higher purpose. When you put it in those terms, it's quite universal and talks about being peace-loving and courageous. But the last line, I think, is the most interesting and the most important here. This notion that what Germany promised, or Nazi Germany promised, to the members of the party, but to the members of the nation more broadly, because the party was not the nation by itself, but the eternal life. What you will do to do what we do today will pass away, but through you, Germany will live on, and your memory will live on. One thing that I think both the Bolsheviks and the Nazis succeeded in doing better, perhaps, than any other society in interwar Europe was giving the members of those societies a sense of their importance in the long scheme of history. A sense of their importance beyond their death in eternity, something that you could believe in. If you think back to the British poems of World War I, what, for example, Wilfred Owen wrote about how we are on the eve of World War I Swimmers into cleanness leaping, tired of a world grown weary. All the little emptiness of love, all the things that we do in this world today are self-interested. They're egotistic, they're egoistic. We have to believe in something bigger than ourselves. This is something that people hungered for in England. They hungered for in France. They hungered for in Bulgaria. They hungered for in Estonia. They hungered for in Spain. And in many ways, the place that met that hunger were the dictatorial right-wing regimes of Europe in the 1930s, and none better than the regimes of Hitler and Stalin. Let me see. So the, uh, the two points I've made to you so far was, number one, Hitler emerges in the context of a party, a party committed to the workers, not vice versa. Secondly, that he offers something to the people that the people want. He gives them trade unions. He gives them the Autobahn. He gives them the Volkswagen, even though actually no Volkswagens are sold in, in Nazi Germany. So, uh, uh, he, The idea of, a, uh, of, of paid vacations, not just the idea, the actual practice of paid vacations. But he also gives them, on the other side, and this was the last slide, something to believe in a sense of the na national purpose that is bigger than themselves, and a sense of united purpose, overcoming the social divisions that constantly tear us apart, overcoming the kinds of divisions we are experiencing now, you might say, in society. Now, in the third part of this, uh, uh, of this discussion of Hitler, I want to talk about how, about the road to Hitler's Holocaust, and how all of these promises in the 1930s actually turn very, very dark indeed, and perhaps become the symbol of sort of evil in the modern world. Joseph Goebbels, the Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, an interesting title, spoke in terms that are actually vaguely reminiscent of, uh, of Stalin and, and sometimes, that he says, the ministry has the task of achieving the mobilization of mind and spirit. We did not lose the war, World War I, that is, because our artillery gave out, but because the weapons of our minds did not fire. This is a very, this is a common sensibility. It would be, it would be a, a, a wonderful subject for, I think, a, a research paper. But on figures like Trotsky, on Goebbels, on, on all of these writers of this era, Walter Benjamin himself, who talk about the relationship between weapons and military on the one hand, and art and on the other. Remember, Trotsky was the head of the Red Army on the one hand, but he was also a great a communist intellectual who wrote about art and literature. The connection between the two is very interesting. Stalin himself, what artists or writers are the engineers of human souls, he says. I mean, more important than tanks is the number of writers in your society. This notion that somehow writers and the spirit matter was mobilized by both Hitler and Stalin to talk about what has to be done. The road to Hitler's holo uh, Holocaust begins, one could say, at a very specific date. It begins on February 27, 1933 with the Reichstag fire, the burning down of the great symbol of German Weimar democracy. It's often uh, around the time of September 11th, 2001 in the United States, these events were compared because it was the Reichstag fire that gives Hitler 
uh, the right to seek an enemy of the people and maybe makes the, the, the pursuit of an enemy of the people popular, just the way in which the war on terror became popular after 2001. A Dutch communist was found and guillotined and, and, uh, as, as the kind of enemy of the people in this case. And the great R Russian uh, lawyer, jurist, Carl Schmidt, concept developed already a few years earlier of the state of emergency was put into effect. The notion that, that in a time of emergency, in a state of emergency, we we're using the term state of emergency to talk about the coronavirus now too, somehow the government can declare extraordinary measures and can set democracy aside in order. But the important thing to note, and this is a fascinating thing that I think a lot of people don't know and don't recognize, is that Hitler never repudiated the Weimar Constitution. Nazi Germany was formerly a democratic state all the way throughout. It never actually said, it just said, postpone it five years because we are in a state of emergency. In five years, we'll reassess the situation and then we'll look again whether we are ready to go back to democracy. So everything that happened under Nazi Germany in World War II happened in a state that had not formally repudiated a democratic system of government shows you how much you can do without, without repudiating uh, a democratic or parliamentary system, how much you can work against the system within its bounds on some level. Hitler's rise to power and the road to the Holocaust involves the purging of internal enemies as well. And for this, June 1934 was the great important moment, the Night of the Long Knives, when the SA, the Sturmabteilung, or the um, uh, le led by Gregor Strasser and Ernst Röhm, Röhm were purged from the ranks of the Nazis, and so Hitler consolidated his hold on, on power. The road to the Holocaust then involves at least two big things. It involved, number one, the declaration of a state of emergency made possible by the Reichstag fire and also by the purge of the internal enemies. Over the course of the 1930s, then, we see uh, the implementation of increasingly, of, of, uh, of increasingly as harsh uh, uh, laws. But the gradual nature of their implementation perhaps prevent a mass popular outburst or rejection. 1933, compulsory sterilization law goes into effect already against all so-called unfit members of society, those who are, uh, are in any way disabled. In 1935, around the time of the rally, we just saw uh, Hitler issues the Nuremberg Law. So the, uh, they are implemented in, uh, in, 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 not, in uh, the German constitution. Jews are now defined as a distinct race rather than as a religion, forbidden to own property, forbidden to marry Aryans, barred from certain professions, declared, in effect, non-citizens, they have no rights under German laws. They are, in essence, stateless. And this is a problem that we'll come back to in the uh, discourse of human rights after World War II, when a lot of uh, European states and thinkers realize that Europe has no way of dealing with countries that turn against their own citizens, against people who are declared stateless within. 1938, the great, uh, say, the night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, when uh, you could say violence is incited and carried out. Uh, here, 91 Jews are murdered, 30,000 Jewish men are deported to concentration camps, synagogues, houses, and businesses are destroyed throughout Germany and Austria. We see the escalation of the sentiment against Jews as Hitler's defined enemies of the people, the most important enemies of the people. If we think back to what Freud taught us about communities of love, Communities of love depend upon having an external or, or an internal, an other, that they can blame for all of their failures. The strength of a community of love, whether it's the Christian community, the Nazi community, or the Bolshevik community, is based on common sense of purpose defined by those who are against you. A community of love has somebody to hate. The road to the Holocaust though, culminates in 1942. I'm skipping a lot of things here. This is a really a cursory once over. But these are maybe the most important uh, steps uh, when we see how 
we go from a general and vague anti-Semitism, a sense that Ger the Jews are the problem that Germany faces, to a set of policies and laws that actually seek to exterminate them. The actual extermination is not, you could say, doesn't become part of the policy until 1942 in the Wannsee Conference with the final solution, uh, which is the final solution. The solution to what? The Jewish question, the thing that we've been talking about ever since Theodor Herzl uh, wrote about what to do, uh, proposed the problem of the Jewish question and the idea of a Jewish state. Hitler's answer to the Jewish question then is extermination and elimination. And this is formulated in the throes of World War II when not too many people are, are, are taking notice. The last little section, I want to move on to Stalin in a second, uh, f on, on, on Hitler and on uh, the Hitler's road to the Holocaust is about really the way in which Hitler defamiliarizes Europe and the promises of modernity. Hitler's New Europe, you could say, begins with a dream, a dream of a greater Germany. Lebensraum sort of is the, world, uh, is the word that is often used to talk about what Hitler's aspirations are, creating greater living space for Germans, mostly in the East, in, in the Ukraine. But the Nazi vision moves in two directions at once. To simplify, it would be important to note how different Hitler's project is and his vision of Europe is looking West and his vision of Europe looking East. What was, for the Nazis, the industrial West? What did they hope to get from, or what did they see in France? That was not really where the Nazi mission lay. It was something that they had to deal with, but it was really part of the world that they had to work around or work through in order to engage in what they were really interested in, which was the conquest of the East, of Ukraine, the breadbasket, the California of Eastern Europe, as they called it. In order to do this, though, they had to get a lot of help. And this is another way in which you can see Hitler and the Nazis embedded in a larger European context. Because until the Second World War, or even into it, we see all kinds of European leaders making excuses for Hitler, supporting him in one way or another, even subscribing to his ideals. Torvald Stauning, the Danish prime minister, March 8, 1941, writes, it is my impression that Germany has certain plans aiming at a lasting European new order, not just a German new order, but a European new order, along the lines of the planned economy known to Germany, which will certainly contain important advantages compared with the lack of planning hitherto reigning, which has been part of the liberalist egoism. So a lot of European leaders are also seeing something good in, the, in, the, in Hitler's project, in the vision of the, the Nazis of bringing planning. And this, and we, we always forgive and forget like, th this aspect of the larger story. We had better calmly and willingly collaborate in the adaptation which I have here hinted at. This was a very common kind of attitude among the leaders uh, in Western Europe. But as I said, in the industrial West was not where Hitler's dreams lay. They lay in Ukraine. Mark Mausauer, the historian, has put it really nicely. The Ukraine was, uh, and right now it is called the Ukraine as a sort of a region or province rather than as a, as a country, was to be turned through German colonization into one of the loveliest gardens of the world. It was, according to an SS leaflet, badly exploited fertile soil of black earth that could be a paradise, a California of Europe. The last uh, point I want to remind you of right here uh, comes from Hitler himself. When he, when he says, when we eat wheat from Canada, we don't think about the despoiled Indians. Indeed, in many ways, what Hitler says calls the West and modernity on its, say, hypocrisy. What is the Faustian story of modernity? It's a story of development, of moving towards integrated democracy and development by removing the people who stand in the way by getting rid of the old couple of Balkus and Philemon, by killing Gretchen. Well, not killing her, just making sure she doesn't stand in the way. And as we move towards this developed future, there are entire populations that might stand in the way of this better and greater dream. When Hitler says, when we eat wheat from Canada, we don't think about the despoiled Indians, he just reminds the world of how much the Americans and the Canadians have eliminated entire populations in the name of making a greater world order. We are all to blame in this. And when Hitler's citing it, he, sh he makes us wonder about where he got the idea in the first place. A lot of people say Hitler's sort of vision of concentration camps comes from South Africa and British colonization. 
They come from places in the West. They are not peculiar pathologies of Germany or, uh, or the East. What we end up with, so in Nazi Germany, is a world, though, of nightmares. And this is the ultimate defamiliarization. A world of concentration camps and slave labor. Some 10,000 concentration camps cover Europe. Europe that was supposed to be about creating a new and bright world order come, becomes instead a world of slave labor. Heinrich Himmler's SS dominates a system of slave labor uh, which divides the populations of Europe into Untermenschen, subhumans, including Jews, Roma, and Slavs. Not, and then, we, of course, we have the Holocaust as the extermination of some six million Jews happening over the course of, this, of the last two years, really, or the last three years of the Second World War. But all along, we have the vision coming both from European writers and from German writers themselves that what their project is is not a uniquely German project. It's a European project. It's a new European order. And thinking ahead, it's worth noting the extent to which the European Union is built, to some extent, on Hitler's foundations. That the European Union and the countries that are brought into alliance, Hitler's dream of making France and Germany work together is what the European Union actually succeeds in doing, ultimately. It's not maybe based anymore on the idea of racial superiority, but the infrastructure, the techniques of management are not entirely uh, foreign. Colonel General Hermann Hoth, a Nazi leader, writes about the German sense of honor and race and a soldierly tradition of many centuries against an Asiatic mode of thinking and primitive instincts. Asiatic mode of thinking and primitive instincts. Who else has used that language in our course so far? Theodor Herzl has used that language in talking about non-Europeans in the, in the Jewish state. This point of view has come from Stalin. It's come from all kinds of French thinkers, German thinkers, English thinkers, H.G. Wells has expressed thoughts like this. These are not original ideas. The ideas that are part of the larger discourse in the story of modernity made by Nobel Prize winners, people like, um, uh, people like the great uh, British writers uh, of the day as well. Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, uh, Eliot are full of these kinds of sentiments. More than ever, we are filled with the thought of a new era in which the strength of the German people's racial superiority and achievements entrusts it with the leadership of Europe. We clearly recognize our mission to save European culture from the advancing Asiatic barbarism. We now know that we have to fight against an incensed and tough opponent. This battle can only end with the destruction of one or the other. A compromise is out of the question. And on that note, I want to move on to Stalin. A compromise is out of the question. In many ways, we're living in this kind of moment, I think, historically today as well. Compromise is out of the question. We want our way of looking at the world, because any other way would be uh, to betray our, our mission and our purpose. Now, in a, in a similar light, the story of socialist nationalism or the rise, to, uh, the road to Stalin's terror, is like the story of Hitler and the Nazi party. It's a story of failure, first and foremost, a failed priest to the great leader, the Vojd. We have the Russian story of the Asobi Put, of a peculiar or special path, just as we had the German story of a Zonderweg, a special path. In many ways, Germany and Russian history are, could be very interestingly told as mirror images of one another. Uh, so many of the same elements are present. And just like Hitler, Stalin is born to very, you could say, unremarkable and surprising uh, origins. I didn't stress with, with, with Hitler, but his accent, too, is a southern German accent. It's not the main dominant accent. In the same way, you could say Stalin's accent was a Georgian accent. It wasn't the Russian accent. Both the Nazi empire and the Soviet empire were ruled by a man who didn't speak the language uh, in the purest way. The parents of, of, um, uh, of Joseph Stalin were Keta van Geladze, Bessorian Jugashvili, and like Hitler's parents, they came from very modest origins. We had here, here's a picture of me on, uh, at, in the house where Stalin was supposedly born, uh, in Gori. Uh, we have uh, father was a cobbler, mother a serf, and fam, uh, a serf uh, came from a serf family and was a maid and a housekeeper. And in later life, when trying to explain his uh, rise to power in the Soviet Union, uh, this dialogue was recorded 
his mother apparently asked him, she was probably going senile, she was senile at the time, Joseph, what exactly are you now? Stalin responded, do you remember the czar? Well, I'm like a czar. And she told him, you'd have, better to have, become, you'd have done better to have become a priest. Some sons can never please their mothers. But perhaps this is the larger, part of the larger story, too. It's that like um, uh, that he had a very harsh childhood and upbringing, that he was beaten by his mother, he was beaten by his father, he was not treated well, and yet he was always made to remember that he wasn't quite good enough. The, main, the first point I want to make about Stalin, like the point about Hitler, is that Stalin does not create the Communist Party. The Communist Party creates Stalin. He, comes, he merges within a context. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union was also a workers' party, like the Nazi Party was, committed to the idea of the workers, in this case not the international workers, not so much the national workers, but as the chosen people who will redeem society, who, who will redeem modernity from its division and alienation, the self-alienation we, we, we saw in the first slide. Stalin's rise to power involves is a, much, is a longer tale and a longer path than Hitler's. Uh, it involves first Lenin's death in 1924, the elimination of rivals like Trotsky, and the use of allies like Nikolai Bukharin, pictured here behind him. Stalin has consolidated his power really by 1928 when he, uh, when he implements the first five-year plan, where he defines in very, uh, uh, and carries out the program of making the world sort of safe for workers. How does he do this? By eliminating the class enemy, the kulaks, the so-called rich peasants. And interestingly, in 1930, when he gives his speech dizzy with success, he actually accuses the common Russian people and the common Soviets of being too eager to be violent. Stalin plays a role throughout history which is quite curious and sort of unexpected, often telling people to be less uh, less violent, and the, the dizzy with success speech is what, one of the first and earliest examples of that. You are dizzy with success. You want to expropriate the peasants. Stop. Let's work more slowly and more uh, forward towards a better future. 1932 to 33, the whole, a lot of more, the great famine in Ukraine, and the source of a lot of Ukrainian, of course, enmity against Russia, is perhaps uh, the, the, the major destructive and you can say a uh, uh, moment of, of, the, of those early years. But 1936, uh, this new Soviet constitution is ordered, and it's proclaimed, in Stalin's own words, and here the word democracy appears again, the most democratic constitution in the world. The ideal of democracy is rhetorically present, and around the newspapers around the world, uh, this idea of, of a more democratic form of government, the most democratic form of government in the world is proclaimed. Along the way, the idea of socialism having been achieved, and the next stop on the, on the road of, of, of social and political evolution being communism. Remind you of Freud's question. One only wonders what the Soviets will do after they have wiped out their bourgeois, after the bourgeoisie. In 1936, the celebration of a new constitution in the Soviet Union proclaimed the most democratic constitution in the world seems to have opened the doors to the next step of social evolution. Remember, the, the, the Marxist vision is you achieve socialism first, and once you achieve socialism, you wait for society to evolve to communism. Communism is the point where the state melts away, you have no more state on all those social divisions, all those castes and distinctions that hold us apart disappear, and you have that unity in the union. I hope you can see how similar this language is to Hitler's language when he's speaking at the Nuremberg, uh, the Nuremberg uh, meeting. about We want to be one people. We want to overcome our internal divisions. We want to overcome all castes and distinctions. That's precisely what Stalin is promising as well in a, in a, in a different key. So the first, this first slide here is to emphasize Stalin's rise to power in the context of a party that already exists. To, Emphasize too that he is the figure who brings to fruition uh, the promises of uh, of Lenin and the early and the earlier leaders of the Soviet Union. Now the second point or the second slide here is about how Stalin creates or recreates a kind of Russia that people can believe in, believe in, the leading nation of the new Soviet friendship of the peoples. 
In his toast to the Russian nation at the Kremlin, at the end of the Second World War, he claims, or he says, I drink in the first place to the health of the Russian people because it, because it is the most outstanding nation of all the nations forming the Soviet Union. And indeed, Stalin's contribution to Russia in many ways is to restore and create national pride. This is somewhat, in some sense, precisely what Hitler has done for Germany, to restore and, and, and bring back national pride. And he does this partly by bringing back figures and institutions that have been forgotten along the way. The, the great Russian writer Pushkin has basically been an ignored figure in Soviet history up until the 1930s. But when Push, Pushkin's birthday a celebration in 1937 rivals the birthday celebrations of Lenin, all of a sudden Pushkin is remembered as the great Russian poet. And recovering Russian literature and, Russian, uh, and a Russian sense of pride in its literature is part of what Stalin brings to the Soviet Union. Also the remaking physically of the cities, of, and particularly of Moscow. The Cathedral of Christ the Savior is demolished, torn down as the great symbol of Christianity in the name of this new atheism, and the Moscow Metro is built. And the man who is responsible for both is one of Stalin's hen henchmen, Lazar Kaganovich, uh, one of the few sort of important uh, sort of Jewish figures in the Soviet Union uh, to survive all the way through. Um, Kaganovich uh, is known as sort of a, the hard-headed dismantler of the, of the cathedral and also the builder of, of, of Moscow to some extent. So Stalin brings pride to Moscow through his construction projects, since a lot of this comes uh, at the end or at the Second World War. But Stalin's seven sisters, as the great skyscrapers of Moscow come to be known, symbolized development, you could say, for the city. The largest of them, the one in the back here, is, of course, Moscow State University, the highest educational building in the world, built largely by German POWs at the end of the Second World War, who are housed on the upper floors. But Soviet power doesn't reach only high into the sky to the highest buildings that Russia has ever seen built by Stalin, but also deep underground, farther underground than anybody has gone. Uh, in many cases, the Mo Moscow metro is more than a kilometer below the earth, becomes the bomb shelters uh, uh, during World War II, and is extravagantly decorated with images of the friendship of the peoples, Ukrainians uh, and, uh, and all the, the nations of the Soviet Union are commemorated in the frescoes of the Moscow metro. And here we see it being used as a bomb shelter in World War II. Just as in Nazi Germany, the party and the idea of a Superman was not a general idea that was applied to everyone. It was part of, or uh, it, was, uh, it was for the elite. Communist party members never equaled more than 7% of the entire society of the Soviet Union, just as Nazi party members did not equal more than 7% of Germans. But the idea of, of the party was important. It set the aspirations for young people. And Soviet youth organizations emerged. They were taken very seriously at first. They were perhaps taken less seriously after the Second World War. But as stages of development for creating a fully formed, fully conscious person who could be both the subject and the object of his or her own development. That is what the idea of the party was. With the October children, for kids who are seven to nine years old, young pioneers, nine to 14, and, and the Komsomol, or the, sort of the, the, the youth organizations, before uh, acceptance or admission to the party was determined. And in this early period, in the 1930s, this, just as the Nazi party was in Germany, membership in the party was a symbol of success and achievement, and it was an aspiration. It wasn't something people uh, thought of as, uh, as something to be looked down on. So I've talked to you now about both Stalin and, 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 and Hitler's uh, aspects of the regimes that, uh, that we have to understand to see why they were loved, admired, and supported in their own day in the 1930s. We've looked now at Stalin's rise to power in the context of the Communist Party as a, as the, uh, a worker's movement and a workers' party. And we've looked also at the way in which he transformed Russia and Moscow in particular into something that Russians could be proud of. And how he emphasized the idea of Russian pride above the pride of all the other uh, member nations of the Soviet Union. But just as with Hitler, the turn towards the ultimate violence and, and, uh, happens in the mid-1930s. If it was the Reichstag fire in Germany that takes us down the road to Hitler's Holocaust, it is the murder 
of Sergei Kirov, the head of the party organization in Leningrad that takes us down the road to Stalin's great terror. Now, the concept of the enemy of the people was already in existence in the Soviet Union. Lenin coined the phrase and already in 1917, but it wasn't widely used. People talk more about enemies of the state or enemies of, uh, it was enemies in a more specifically political sense. Enemy of the people was a much stronger and far-reaching uh, statement. And it came into full flower, you could say, in 1934 at the time of the assassination of Sergei Kirov. The question became, what is the rot? What is the problem in our own society that allowed our prominent party leader to be murdered? Who is to blame? What is to be done? The great, great Russian questions. So we have the, uh, the assassination of Kirov, and then the pursuit over the next few years of the culprits, the enemies. Basically, not officially, but basically, as in Germany, the declaration of a state of emergency. From 1936 to, 39, uh, to 1939, the Soviet Union claimed some 750,000 victims who were uh, identified and eliminated on, uh, through various uh, secret police orders. Uh, the mass operations are the ones I'm emphasizing on this slide. Uh, and it's since the uh, opening of the Soviet archives, the specific directives and archival documents that the, and the, and the demands or commands uh, have come to light. 20 years ago, nobody would have known, 30 years ago, nobody would have known about Z Order 00447, which basically, with one stroke of one pen, consigned to death some 387,000 people. Or, and that was the Kulak operations, the, the operations taken against uh, class enemies. Uh, the national operations, people uh, taken against members of nations who were considered to be suspect, targeted for extermination were, were Poles, Germans, Finns, Estonians, Latvians, Koreans, Chinese, Kurds, Iranians, or at least this was the reason given for uh, their ultimate uh, executions. But the national operations and the Kulak operations were not simply executions, they were also population transfers. Koreans were moved uh, uh, westward, uh, to the Kazakh USSR. And actually, my first Russian teacher in, uh, in Moscow was, you could say, a product of this. Her name was Nadezhda Kim. She's a member of that Korean diaspora that had been deported. Her parents, or her grandparents rather, had been deported to the Kazakhstan, and then she had moved uh, up to, to Moscow in the meantime. One interesting thing to point out here is how much society is being remade by these major sort of uh, population transfers as well as these targeting executions. Uh, one thing to note here uh, is who are the enemies of the people in the, uh, in, under Stalinism? Well, we have the class enemies, the kulaks, the enemy nations like the Poles, but then there are also the members of the former world order, the people we talked about in the context of, of, of Tanya Alexander and Mura Budborg. The, the noblemen, the aristocrats, who has, have been in some ways left behind. But the least explicable and perhaps the hardest to understand in this story are the Bolshevik elite themselves. Nobody was more targeted by Stalin's terror than the highest ranking officials of the Bolshevik regime themselves. And this remains one of the great and most difficult questions to answer in the history of the 20th century. Why should a regime turn against its own elite? Let that sink in. Why should a regime turn against its own elite? I see people getting tired a little bit. I'm going in. <laughs> Most of our logic doesn't help explain this. We like to say people act in self-interest. They want to benefit their own party. They want to do something for themselves. How can we explain a regime that actually turns against its own highest officials? Well, once a, you can try to explain it away. You could say, well, in fact, those are infighting among different members of the elite, different factions, and in fact, Stalin was just consolidating his own power. But I don't think that's enough, or that doesn't do it quite. Because ultimately, in purging the Soviet elite, Stalin eliminated some of his greatest allies and, and, and hurt his, you could say, hurt his, uh, his chances of, of winning the Second World War. Also undermined, you could say, the very, the very project that he, was, that, that he was engaged in or part of. But there's something fundamentally anti-elite about the Soviet project and the Soviet mission. And if the Soviet experiment was all about the worker, 
they couldn't help but constantly be eliminating elites, constantly be eliminating people from the top of society in the name of reinventing, reimagining society, creating a world where all that is solid melts into air, where the things that exist right now are gone tomorrow because we want to make room for the people who haven't yet been recognized, who haven't yet risen to the top. The troikas and the quotas, this was the, these are the, the, the primary, you could say, technique for eliminating um, uh, the, the enemies of the people from society. Uh, these, uh, showed, uh, these, these trials and, that, were ta that were conducted over the course of, over the Soviet countryside. But the Moscow tr show trials are the most famous where the most prominent members of the Bolshevik intelligentsia were one by one brought before tribunals, laughed at, scorned, and usually shot. General Mikhail Tukhachevsky was a great example, a great hero of the, of, of the First World War, and of the, or rather of the Civil War, the subject of Nikita Mikhailkov's Burnt by the Sun. We don't really have time, but let me play this for you just here. A, a clip from this movie where you see, and the larger question I would like you to think about and ask here, uh, it, it applies to Bukharin's last letter too, is how, what is it that create, makes people turn against one another, to betray one another uh, in, this, in this environment? So the situation here is uh, the great general, he goes, he goes by a different name here, is Kotov, played by Nikita Mikhailkov, is uh, enjoying his last hour of freedom before he's taken away by, uh, to really be uh, interrogated and, uh, and probably eliminated. And he's confronting uh, uh, a former uh, lover of his wife, uh, who supposedly is the one who, or who seems to be the one who has turned him in. And we see the dialogue between them, and his daughter appears at one point as well here. They've been playing soccer. They're looking for the ball. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Арестованный гражданин Котов? Я 
Между прочим, пошел на должностное преступление и вас предупредил. Врешь! Опять врешь. Ты ведешь себя как последнее, блядь, опять. Нашим и вашим, чтобы я потом учел. Ты же знаешь, чем все кончится. Кто меня тронет? Кто меня тронет? Герой революции, легендарного Комдива. Кто меня тронет, Котова? Ух, я тебе все это напомню. Ух, я посмотрю на тебя. Не через пять. Когда ты ползая в собственном говне, собственноручно подпишешь признание, что ты с 20 -го года являешься немецким шпионом. А с 23-го еще и японским. И что ты диверсант, и организатор покушения на Ариша Сталин. А если не подпишешь, сука, то мы тебе напомним, что у тебя есть жена и дочь. Папа, папа! Пионеры идут! Тебе! Папа, пионеры твои идут! Какие пионеры? Че? А где дядя Митяй? А дядя Митяй мячик нашел. Ну, а ты знаешь, чем мне бежать сегодня в этом доме? Постоянно. So you see, I think this is just a wonderful evocation of the, of the, of the, of the, the deep divisions and tensions sort of within, uh, within society that are coming to the fore in the course of the, of the trials and of the, of the purge of the Soviet elite that's happening in the late 1930s. But if nothing else, it shows the extent to which this, of the failure of the promise. The aim was to create a community of love, a community of love where everybody gets along, where people are part of the same project, the same community, the same, the same mission. And yet we see all the ways in which this is bringing out the worst in them, the hatred, the various ways in which they, the, the old resentments, the ways in which somebody took somebody's house 20 years ago, or, 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 or the resentments against uh, other people's success, all of this is being enabled and coming to the fore in the course of the trials of the 1930s. Now, when you read Bukharin's letter, and this is perhaps the most famous document to come out of the trial at all, you notice him appealing to Stalin uh, as an intimate friend, calling him Koba, his, uh, the friend of his youth, uh, his comrade in arms. Why have you put me in prison? Why have you forsaken me? It's a little bit like Jesus to God on the cross. There's something great. And then he tries to rationalize and make sense of what's going on. And he writes to Stalin about the larger world historical promise of communism and how maybe he has to lay down his own life for it. There's something great and bold about the political idea of a general purge, he writes. It is connected with the pre-war situation, connected to the transition to democracy. This purge encompasses the guilty, the persons under suspicion, and persons potentially under suspicion. I might, I'm not guilty myself. And I want you to know that I'm not guilty. But I understand, I might, maybe I have to die in order to make this larger promise of communist modernity come about. The purge ends with the execution of the executioner. Nikolai Yezhov was, uh, during the, uh, the time of the Great Terror, uh, the last great uh, executioner. Well, he was followed by Beria. But uh, Yezhov, you see, you see here, is this. Uh, uh, walking next to Stalin. In later photographs, he was all that assaulted Nelson to air, including, including Yezhov, you can see. Uh, but the, pro the whole process of, uh, of the terror came to be known as sort of the actions of Yezhov, or the Yezhovshina. Uh, he, and uh, we see it all collapse when, these, uh, when, when the executioner is executed. In the Soviet Union, like Europe, the Soviet Union under Stalin, like uh, Europe under Hitler, the world that was supposed to be a worker's paradise became instead a set of slave labor camps. The Gulag Archipelago, most famous work to describe this world, written by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the camp inmate from 45 to 53, who lived in Siberian exile from 53 to 56 only really came to the attention of the Western world in the, in the 1970s. But it showed that Lubyanka, the headquarters of the Russian secret police, 
across the entire reach of the, of the 20th century. This is the building that was the capital or the headquarters of the Ukraina, the Tsarist secret police. It became the, cap the headquarters of the Cheka and various incarnations in black you see of the Soviet secret police, the OGPU, the GPU, the NKVD, the MVD, the KGB, and today it is the headquarters of the FSB in Russia. It was sometimes joked that it was the tallest building in Moscow since Siberia could be seen from the basement. This was the place where people were killed, where people were sort of sent away for good. Uh, I walked around it once when I was in Moscow, and of course, when you know the, when you know the history of the building, you can't help but get a chill. But the Gulag Archipelago, which is a wonderful title of Solzhenitsyn's book, describes the whole Soviet Union as this kind of islands, islands camps of, of camps spread across the reach of the Soviet Union, uh, where everywhere you could be sent for your crimes against the regime. There were some 476 camps and colonies, and the industrial cities, the developed cities of Vorkuta, Norilsk, Kolyma, Magadan, were originally camps built by prisoners and run by ex-prisoners. We confront the same question with Stalin that we confronted with Hitler's. How did this vision of a workers' party liberating the common people turn into a world of slave labor, a world of forced and coerced of, uh, repressions in the name of creating that better, greater world? And we're left here at the end. I'll go two minutes more here just with this, the Hitler-Stalin pact, Europe and Russia together at last. We, we see the head of, of course, uh, the Molotov, uh, Stalin's representative, Ribbentrop, Hitler's representative, uh, shaking hands here uh, in Moscow. The largest story I've told you here is a story about, four, it consists of four points. The way Hitler and Stalin both rose to power in the context of parties committed to workers. The way in which they both created a new society, a new Germany and a new Russia that in some sense fulfilled and met the, uh, the, the desires and the dreams of the people they ruled. And along the way, they both singled out not only chosen people, but chosen enemies to eliminate, to purge, to get rid of in order to make their dream come, become a reality. But along the way, they also seemed to create the opposite of what they had desired. They turned a world that was supposed to be a workers' paradise in the Soviet case, a German folk paradise with workers in it, in Hitler's case, into a world of slave labor camps. This is the last slide. And I want to sort of note how the same slogan, and this is the ultimate ir irony and the ultimate defamiliarization, is that in the concentration camps run by slave labor, Mazar claims, like the Soviet Union in the 1930s, the wartime right became a slave labor economy. Both included, whether cynically or not, it's hard to say, but on their, on their, on their camps, these slogans about how work is the ultimate ideal and work sets you free. Arbeit macht frei, of course, is the famous slogan that we find on Auschwitz and on Sachsenhausen. Work sets you free. What does that actually mean? And we've seen a very similar slogan on some of the gulag camps. Right? Through labor to freedom. This was a speech from Stalin, changing the way people see work, transforming labor from a disgraceful and heavy burden to a matter of honor, glory, valor, and heroism is what Stalin claimed he was trying to do in 1930s. The slogan Arbeit macht frei actually comes from an 1873 novella by a pastor in 19th century German national movement, Lorenz Diefenbach in which a gambler, a man who is taken with the egoistic world of making a profit and only thinking about himself, learns the value of contributing to society, thinking about people other than himself. It's funny that this is the slogan that the Nazis put on their camp and that the Soviets put a very similar slogan. So in the last moment of both Hitler's Germany and in Stalin's Russia, we see the appeal to the idea of the value of work, which is where they started in the first place, seeking to liberate labor from the chains of its liberal imprisonment. Emancipation of Labor was Russia's first Marxist organization, founded in Geneva in 1883 by Vera Sasulich, among others. So on that note, I want to end and sort of leave you to sort of think about 
a strand in the story that I don't think gets emphasized enough. It's not the only strand. You can tell the story in a different way. But the fundamental importance of the ideal of labor, liberating labor, to both the Nazi and to the Soviet experiments, and how that went fundamentally wrong, and how ultimately we've been picking up the shards of that, you could say, disaster ever since. So thank you. <laughs>